especially fueled by the city's strong Christian roots. It's a response that Christians, as you pointed out, have always offered in a way that no one else has, at least not on such a scale. The helpers in Nashville are answering the world's brokenness, in this case, uh, natural calamity with service, with love, obedience to the, the great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. And I think what's more interesting even is that uh, per Jesus parable, nobody in Nashville seems to be asking who their neighbor is. They're uh, fulfilling his commandment by being neighbors rather. And that was just, that's a cool story. And that's something that's, I think probably has broader implications for how we deal with something like coronavirus, even though it's of course a different situation as far as the response. Yeah. You know, there's a worldview angle to all of this. And in our editorial team, we kicked around a, uh, a YouTube kind of, I think it's called a Lewis doodle. I didn't know that this even existed, but apparently <laughs> oh, yeah, people... it's almost all of his works, at least the, the nonfiction stuff have doodles. Yeah, C.S. Lewis is who we're talking about, and you know, a piece of writing that he did on the atomic bomb. And we'll link to this, by the way, if you come to breakpoint.org, including the video. Plus, our commentary on Friday, Breakpoint Commentary, deals with some of this. Where he's basically trying to wrestle with a, a world now in which the atomic bomb exists, which is a world of fear. It's a world of vulnerability. I mean, you probably don't remember it, really, Shane, but I'm old enough just to remember um, the beginning of the atomic age, John. You're old enough to remember the 40s, not the beginning of it, but when. <laughs> but really, I mean, the atomic age was exacerbated because the two people who had access to atomic weapons were mm-hmm. enemies, right? I mean, this right. is the Cold War, and I remember the panic over nuclear proliferation uh, and so on. But that was, you know, 20 years into it. I mean, can you imagine from the very beginning, um, the escalating tensions, how close things came in Cuba uh, with President Kennedy and so on? And and this was the sort of same level of uncertainty and fear that C.S. Lewis was trying to write to. But one of the things that he reflects on is that, look, we're fearful and we're uncertain, not because this stuff couldn't be really serious, because it really could be serious. But it also tells us something about the nature of reality. I mean, it's that you know, fantastic angle that Lewis often took in his works, which this tells us that something's wrong with the world. Mm. But which worldview explains that there is something wrong with the world as opposed to I don't like the way the world turned out. And there's an evidence here of our gut level instinct saying something's wrong here that points to that there is a way things ought to be. And if there is a way things ought to be, then that means the world is designed. And if the world is designed, then that points to a designer. So there's some worldview questions and there's some worldview revelations that things like, you know, the uncertainty of natural disasters like tornadoes in Nashville or the coronavirus, uh, which would you know be sickness around the world. This stuff points to something we should know about ourselves. And as Christians respond to this, as we run into the brokenness, let's remain convinced that what the world needs most of all is a message, a message of salvation and hope in Christ Jesus, not just kind of good works, although it does need good works, but it also needs the message. And there's some creative things here about what we can know and what we can say in light of this thing that we're now facing. Amen. Well, you're listening to Breakpoint this week. I'm Shane Morris talking with John Stone Street. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back to talk about more of the top stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. Stay with us. We invite you to visit Breakpoint.org. And while you're at our website, be sure to browse our online Colson Center store of books and other resources. And you can find links to our social media sites like Facebook and Twitter. We're back on Breakpoint this week. Folks, if you heard something on the program today that you want to learn more about, read more about, just come to Breakpoint.org, click on the banner for the show, and we'll link you to everything that John and I mentioned today. John, we have another story here on the religious freedom and uh, sexual revolution front where the former Vice President Joe Biden is, he's rolled out his LGBT rights plan, which would more or less reverse pretty much everything that's happened in recent years under the Trump administration, and then advance the uh, so-called Equality Act, which, uh, as we talked about before on Breakpoint, would more or less steamroll not only religious liberty, but uh, women's sports and a whole slew of other issues there. So this is related to another story in Canada where the government there is uh, proposing a very similar set of measures, especially a ban on uh, so-called conversion therapy. Yeah, it, look, this is uh, probably it should be fought under the elections have consequences, uh, you know, sort of uh, banner. I mean, th- look, and I say this on two levels. Number one is I think people have a pretty short memory. People forget the sort of pressure that was being put on religious communities and was really being supported. Uh, that pressure was being supported at the federal level. You know, if we're talking about what was happening to Jack Phillips from the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, you know, and that was kind of a, went from being kind of national pressure to a kind of a local irritant, even though they had, so haven't gone away. But remember the Dear Colleague letter when President Obama sent a letter to every educator in America saying, you know, look, we need to integrate restrooms. And by the way, I might just tie Title IX and Title Seven funding to this. This is not a small thing. And the reversals that have taken place have been dramatic and basically gone from making LGBTQ rights the kind of the lead headline on all domestic and foreign policy initiatives to basically uh, kind of calming down and creating space for people of uh, conscience to continue to work in the federal government, continue to work in education, continue to work in sports and so on and so on and so on. Now I bring this up to say, look, In other words, the advances that we've had or the reversals that we've had really to kind of get back to somewhat of a normal status quo, these things are not written in stone. These are not enshrined in a Supreme Court decision or a uh, congressional piece of legislation. And also, I say that for a second just to remind people how dramatically different it was under the last president, particularly for those who can't seem to understand why anyone can be a pro-Trump evangelical. I'm not letting anybody off the hook who kind of understate, you know, moral problems that this president has had. We've tried to call balls and strikes. We've tried to say it as it actually is. But what we need to remember is, is that uh, particularly candidates for president come with a whole network of people and policy initiatives. And these things matter. And we've seen that they kind of dramatically matter. And let me just remind you, if you read through Joe Biden's promises to the LGBTQ community, now we all know that there's a huge difference between what a candidate promises and what a president delivers. So let's keep that in mind. That said, um, look, this is not just life under uh, President Obama's initiatives again. This is actually taking this even further. The Equality Act enshrines uh, sexual choices and sexual confusions in the Civil Rights Act. 
this is no small thing, and that's what he's promising to pass. Yeah, the, sort the, of the whole conversion. Christmas list of LGBT legislation, this is the big one. This is the gift that they've you know wanted for years and years and have been pressing for, and, and Joe Biden's promising if he's elected president to give it to them. He's, that's what he's promising. And you know, look, we can also go into what's being promised uh, when it comes to uh, abortion, what's mm-hmm. being promised to abortion providers, what's being promised to those who are run pro-life clinics and the onerous regulations that states like California and New York have put on them, not to mention uh, freeing up abortion all the way up to birth. And maybe if mm-hmm. you listen to the governor of Virginia after birth, these are not small things. This is what kind of falls into the category of elections have consequences and candidates come with a whole team of people. I mean, we talked about this recently, Shane, the Health and Human, Human Services Department, HHS, like it is a different day. The Ninth Circuit Court, it's a completely different day. So look, these things matter and they matter pretty dramatically. Yeah. And just to head off one of the objections that you often hear, John, is that this is not a solely selfish complaint. This is not a bunch of Christians saying, well, we're going to lose our, our privileged status, our special status in the culture. We're talking about victims here, John. We're talking about the unborn. We're talking about those who are swept along in this sexual rights tidal wave and uh, end up believing lies that ruin their whole lives. We just did a commentary this past week on the growing group of so-called detransitioners in the UK and the United States. These are these are people who have believed the idea that they're going to solve all their problems by getting you know gender transition therapies, whether chemical or surgical. And then they get to the end of it and they realize, what did I do? I've ruined my life now. I've messed up my body. And they want someone to answer for it. In a lot of cases, they were genuinely manipulated, like this uh, one woman in particular who's suing the British Health Service for not intervening because she was tax time blowout position as a minor. These are the kinds of things that we're that we're talking about. There are real victims to these bad ideas, and it's not just that we're. I mean, as important as religious liberty is, that's far from the only thing we're trying to protect here. We're also trying to protect those who are you know too vulnerable to resist the ideology. Yeah, and this is all part of the confusion that's created uh, from the sexual revolution. Uh, you know, there were more videos, by the way, speaking of confusions at the hands of the sexual revolution. There were more videos this, w- this week kind of going around of uh, Hollywood praising uh, the most notorious uh, abuser of women in the world in America, certainly out of Hollywood, Harvey Weinstein, who this year was sentenced to 23 years for his crimes. Um, you know, so far, the, the biggest target of the Me Too movement and the biggest win, I think, for the Me Too movement in terms of exposing the powerful perpetrators of sexual assault and harassment against women. And, you know, but this kind of underscores the, the confusion of how women have been told to be behave in Hollywood. And, and then when they do, it's being used against them in ways to get roles and so on. And Weinstein was the master of this and abused women in ways that impacted them for the rest of their lives. Uh, it's kind of, a, you know, the next chapter of kind of the great reckoning that we're dealing with. Yeah, John, this is more an indictment of more than Harvey Weinstein. I've watched this thing unfold over the last couple of years. You know, I watched colleagues and actors joke about Weinstein's reputation, Hollywood colleagues and actors of his. I watched Ricky Gervais call them out, all of them at the Golden Globes. It's obvious that Weinstein, as guilty as he is and as much as he deserves this, has become something of a scapegoat for the industry. One of the defining features, I think, of the sexual abuse scandals, whether we're talking about Hollywood or the Boy Scouts or the Olympics or the Catholic Church, has been this complicity. It's been the the silence of those who should have spoken up, who should have said something on behalf of victims. We talked a few years ago about at one of our Wilberforce weekend conferences about the theme of breaking the spiral of silence. And, and the idea was that the more people People who decide to keep quiet when they should speak up and to keep their lips zipped when they should, you know, open them. The idea is that the more people who keep quiet, who should speak up, the harder it is then for someone to finally speak up. The harder it is then for uh, Rachel Den Hollander to come forward and say something happened here that is not okay, and a lot of people know about it, and I'm the first one who's going to say something about this. So, yeah, Harvey Weinstein's being locked up, and that's a good thing, but that doesn't mean the rot is contained. The entire industry has been complicit in this for very long, not just that industry, but a lot of other areas. That's what the Me Too movement, however imperfectly, I think is trying to address. Yeah, I mean, when you when you expose an evil that evil, then it's going to be messy. And there's no way around it. There's only a way through it. And we can talk about Hollywood, but we also know that this is something that has long been hidden in order to protect institutions uh, that are Christian, whether Christian schools, Christian churches, or so on. I I spoke to a Christian community last weekend, Shane, uh, and I won't say which one it is, but a pretty conservative Christian community. And and that question was asked, how do we empower young women in kind of the face of the, you know, the sexual revolution? And one of the things that we said, and particularly for this community that has pretty, a pretty traditional understanding of, you know, women in society and, and even in subcultures and so on, is just to say, look, this has been hidden for so long. And when it comes up, it threatens the community. And because it threatens the community, then it's the spiral of silence gets really forced down on that. And I'm really grateful. I recommended Rachel Den Hollander's uh, book as well. And I, again, this has opened up a big old can of worms. And there's innocent people being accused, but there's a whole lot of cockroaches that are scurrying. And it's just going to be messy. And you know, my advice for this community was don't protect the community at the expense of an individual. Don't protect the industry at the expense of an individual. Don't shove this evil into the closet. The day after the evil is revealed, even if it hurts more, is better than the day before when it's still hidden. And you know, this is kind of the Christian vision of evil is that it's dealt with. It's confronted. It's not swept under the rug. It's not hidden and so on. And it, and it makes it really hard. I think one of the hard things about watching this is in certain church communities th- th- right now, being willing to call this out and being willing to own up to it is kind of being equated with being a liberal. Listen, there's plenty of theological and church liberalism to deal with when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to visions. But you know what? Dealing with perpetrators because they're perpetrators, dealing with those who did hide, sweep it under the rug instead of dealing with it in order to protect their institutions, this is messy stuff. But what are you talking about? The alternative is to sacrifice a child, to mm-hmm. sacrifice a, a woman, to sacrifice an image bearer on the altar of our of our institutions. No, no, no. I go back to C.S. Lewis. Since we started with him, we'll end with him. You know, And that is that you know, cultures, arts, civilizations are mortal, but every single person you have ever met is immortal and we don't sacrifice the immortal on the altar of the mortal.
John, there's one last story I want to get to today before we close. Uh, the Associated Press reports that federal judges on Wednesday grilled attorneys on both sides of an Ohio law that would saddle doctors with a felony charge if they performed abortions aimed at preventing the birth of a baby with Down syndrome. Uh, Jesse Hill, who's an attorney for the ACLU, said that this law seeks to unconstitutionally take the ultimate decision on abortion away from a woman, away from a mother. Benjamin Flowers, who is Ohio's uh, solicitor general, who's on the side of the law defending it, says uh, rather that it seeks to prevent abortions that target and discriminate against those with Down syndrome, which would send them a message, he said, that doctors and parents don't think people like you are as valuable as others. And I'll tell you what, this ban, I think, is more useful potentially as a way of exposing abortion's logic than it is as a way of actually saving lives. And let me let me explain that real quickly. This is a kind of a counterintuitive approach because I do support the ban and I hope it holds up in an increasingly, thank God, uh, conservative judiciary here. But I also don't think that given current legal premises and precedent, it really has a leg to stand on. If a woman's got a right to kill an otherwise healthy baby because it's unwanted, then she's it's very hard to make the case that she doesn't have a right to kill a baby who's diagnosed with Down syndrome in the womb. That's a very hard case to make. But I think I think a law like this, along with the challenges of sex selective abortion and gender side, for example, you know, killing baby girls, which is common in immigrant communities and internationally, help expose the basically horrifying logic of abortion, that it, it forces the other side to defend the indefensible, uh, which in this case is literally a form of eugenics. That's what it is. They have to say that wiping out people with Down syndrome is acceptable as long as it's done through the sacred right to choose. And that's a very, very hard sell. But I think it's very revealing of the fundamental logic at work in the pro-choice movement. Yeah, I, I had very similar thoughts in that, you know, look, I, every young baby in the womb with Down syndrome who's protected by this law, then that's an actual win, right? Amen. But at the same time, we also realizing that, yeah, the norm in America is you can get an abortion if you want to, quote unquote, balance your family. In other right. words, you've had too many boys and now you want a girl. You've had too many girls and now you want to have a boy. Or you did, you know, basically the in vitro fertilization and you have too many, you know, embryos that have, you know, stayed alive in your womb and you don't want three triplets. You want just one. You can do what's called embryo reduction. All of this is the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Unless there's something fundamentally wrong. And we already know, for example, that not only do uh, children with Down syndrome report higher than average rates of ha personal happiness, but their siblings actually like them better than siblings usually like siblings. <laughs> I mean, th there's no quality of life here at question except inconvenience. And the question then we're going to have to face is, is inconvenience enough to say that another child or another human being is not valuable and that someone should have the right to take their lives? And that's going to have implications. The ripple effect is going to be, I think, across the board. I think the inconsistency here is loud. And I think this sort of precedent, because it really works both ways, right? If it's okay to take the life of somebody because they're inconvenient, then we need to scream you know, loud and long about how that's essentially eugenics with the right. legal cover. If this law stands, then we need to go to the next vulnerable community and say, look, if it's wrong to take the life of someone who's down with Down syndrome just because they have Down syndrome, you know mm -hmm. what? It's wrong to take the life of someone who's a female just because they're a female or any other sort of condition that has the sort of inconvenience tag kind of placed on it. So, yeah, this is something that we need to pray about. The other thing I'll say too, Shane, is, of course, we've got something really uh, big happening at the Supreme Court just recently. Oral arguments were heard in uh, testing a Louisiana abortion restriction, which basically uh, Louisiana passed a law similar to the Texas law, which said that abortion doctors needed to have admitting privileges at hospitals within 30 miles. And that was struck down in Texas because of the effect that it would have in closing abortion clinics and creating undue burdens on a woman, woman's right. What's mm -hmm. interesting about this case is even though the language is the same, the situation on the ground is so different between Louisiana and Texas. So in Texas, it would have closed probably about 70 percent of the abortion clinics. In Louisiana, maybe 30 percent of the women seeking abortion would be affected. Maybe one doctor would have a hard time, you know, finding those admitting privileges. In other words, the situation on the ground means it wouldn't have as much of an impact. So it doesn't have that sort of undue burden as it's been defined by the Supreme Court. What it's pointing to is this, if the, the court comes back and rules and says, well, but, you know, listen, on, on the case on the ground here in Louisiana is different than the case on the ground here in Texas. Now we know that we have a court that will consider very carefully the differences community to community to community, which this underscores something we've been saying since the court's been remade, that this court is unlikely to do a whole overturn of Roe v. Wade. What we know about the Supreme Court is that they're unlikely to reverse things that they've already ruled on. Secondly, that they're unlikely to do sweeping rule, uh, sweeping rulings. They're going to do more narrow parsings and let the culture kind of work itself out. We've seen that with Jack Phillips. We've seen that with other cases as well. All this means, you know what, Shane? The court's not going to take care of Roe v. Wade. Local activism becomes more important than ever. Local caring for pregnant women become more important than ever. This is an Ohio law. If this goes, then it can go to the next state and the next state and the next state and the next state. Listen, there's, this is no time to sit on our haunches and you know wait for the court to solve our problem. And this is exactly the kind of smart pro-life work, I think, on a legislative level that's going to win the day, that will win the day if it succeeds, whether it's you know admitting privileges or the pain capable act or dealing with gender side, you know, gender selective abortions or, or eugenic type abortions, like with the Down syndrome thing. The strategy that unites all of these, and I think it's a very effective strategy, is to force the other side to defend the indefensible. They have to say, well, you know, abortion clinics don't have to be up to med basic medical standards. We won't kill babies after they can feel pain. OK, well, let's do that. What about before they can? You know, what about there's still a baby? It reveals the fundamental question that, you know, Scott Klusendorf always comes back to. And he's so good about this, a pro-life apologist, where he says the only question that really matters in abortion is what is the unborn? All the other stuff is distractions. All the stuff about back alley abortions and, and your different regulations and why you're getting an abortion. It's all a distraction. The really, the really important question is what is the unborn? If it's a person, then you can't intentionally kill that person regardless of what your reason is. If it's not a person, then none of this stuff matters anyway. It's just a blob of tissue. Yeah, indeed.
Well, John, that's all the time we have for today. Come to Breakpoint.org for links to all the stories we talked about today on the program, folks. And uh, be sure to get more content by subscribing if you haven't already to the Breakpoint podcast. You can find that at Breakpoint.org. For the Colson Center and for John Stone Street, I'm Shane Morris. Thanks so much for listening. Well, St. Patrick's Day is just around the corner, and if you're like most Americans, you grew up knowing very little about the namesake of this day. In fact, the trappings of leprechauns and pots of gold and stout beer and a general anticipation of spring often kind of overwhelms the story of the saint himself. But who was St. Patrick? Why is he so beloved by not just the Irish, but by the Christian world as a whole? And what is the significance of the revival he began in Ireland? I'm Shane Morris. Welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast. I'm joined today by a former co-worker of mine and a dear friend of Chuck Colson's, someone whom Chuck called his theological advisor. T.M. Moore is a poet, author, and a theologian who served in pastoral and theological ministries for decades decades now. He's also one of the most thoroughgoing experts I know on Celtic Christianity, and this man we celebrate here each March. TM lives in Vermont with his wife Susie, without whom he says none of his writing would be possible. TM, welcome to the program. It's great to have you on. It's great to be with you, Shay. Good to see you. Well, TM, could you introduce us, first of all, to St. Patrick? Because in many ways, I mean, there are figures in Celtic Christianity who sort of precede him, but Patrick is really the watermark. He's really the moment when Celtic Christianity kind of kicked off and became a world-influencing force. Who is this man? Why was he so remarkable? How did God use him? Those are good questions because he is truly a remarkable person. He's not Irish first, and we need to make that clear. He was raised on the west coast of Britain in a place called Banaventura, where we don't know where that is today, but that's where he says he was born. And uh, he was just a kid in a nominal Christian home doing his kid stuff. And when he was 16 years old, out on a field day with some of his friends, they were all kidnapped by Irish raiders and carried over to Ireland and put in, sold into slavery. Patrick was taken all the way to the west coast of Ireland and sold to a man for whom he kept his sheep as a slave for six years. And it was only at the end of that period of time that he was led by God to flee from his captor and return to his homeland. And that's when the real adventure began. He prayed every night from the moment he was taken captive because he perceived it was a punishment from God. He prayed for deliverance. He sought the Lord to deliver and revive him. And after six years, the Lord did. Sent him home. His parents were so glad to see him. Made him promise he would never leave them again. And then came another vision from God of a person from the west of Ireland calling him to come back and serve them. And he believed that was a call from God. And so he liquidated his inheritance. The church wouldn't support his going over. His family wouldn't support his going over. But he knew he was called of God. And he went to Ireland as a missionary. Now, there were Christian enclaves there. Work had started. It wasn't doing much. It wasn't growing very much. But from the time that Patrick arrived there, became a deacon, and then began to be involved more in the work of preaching, for many, many years, thousands upon thousands of people came to Christ. New communities of believers were formed, and out of that began the whole movement, which has come to be known as the Celtic Revival, a great movement of God's Spirit that caught up all of Ireland, all of Scotland, Wales, England, much of the Low Countries, France, Northern Italy, Switzerland, for 400 years, and in the words of Thomas Cahill, saved civilization. It was a great movement. It began with one man. Well, TM, why is it called the Celtic Revival? I had that question sort of reading, you know, Cahill's thesis and the stuff that we've discussed. Was there Christianity in Ireland beforehand in the Celtic regions, or was this really sort of an introduction of the faith? There was Christianity in Ireland, but there was not yet a movement of God's Spirit among the Celtic peoples of Ireland or of Scotland. The Celtic peoples moved across Europe, perhaps from Northern Asia Minor, over a thousand years prior to the birth of Christ, and kept moving until they got to Ireland and Scotland and Wales, where they made their primary home. They had a rich culture, although it was not a literate culture. They had a very rich religion, very sort of pantheistic, animistic sort of religion. And they were a very hardy, hardy people, but there was no Christianity to speak of among them until Patrick came. And because he had been there as a slave for six years, he knew these people, he knew their language, he knew how to relate to them. And so as he came amongst them, he could speak to them in their terms, the gospel very plainly. And obviously the Lord had preceded him there and prepared the hearts of many people because he had a great ministry success. Even though he was sold into slavery two more times and had to buy his way out of slavery, he still had great success. And we know of his story from two extant writings from his own hand. One is called his confession, which he wrote toward the end of his ministry career when he was being called to come back to Britain and give an account of his ministry. He didn't want to do that because he didn't want to leave the field, and so he wrote this deposition instead. And then another document called The Letter Against the Soldiers of Caroticus, which he wrote as a letter of ex excommunication against some allegedly Christian soldiers who'd done some pretty terrible things. And that's all we have about St. Patrick, the next documents that really mention him with any attention, really, from two centuries later, and they have been significantly expanded beyond what we really, really know about Patrick. The Breastplate of St. Patrick, for instance, which is almost like a mort d'Arthur for Patrick. It's yeah, it is. It wasn't written by him at all, Patrick's Breastplate or the Cry of the Heart, however it's called. But there are two biographies about Patrick, one by Merhu and one by Tir Khan from the 7th century. And those are, in a sense, and I have to be fair and honest, that's in a sense of two representatives of the Roman Catholic Church to reach back to Patrick and retell his story in terms mm -hmm. that fit him in the Roman Catholic period that followed after the Synod of Whitby in around 670, 671. But before that, Patrick was not really a part of the Roman Church. He was aware of the Roman Church. He at least considered himself a part of the Roman Church, but he was not under any authority of Rome. His bishops and pastors back home did not support him. And those Irish Christians were pretty much on their own to try to cobble together a faith based on the historic creeds of the Church and the teaching of Scripture. And they succeeded in spades, as many have testified. 
Well, that leads us to the question of what is so unique about Celtic Christianity, because it does seem to have this character that sets it apart from even those other churches with which it was in nominal communion, the Church of Rome, for instance. And we tend to think of, you know, apologists and historians often look back and they sort of flatten history and they act as if, well, it's always sort of been just as straightforward and hierarchical as it has been. And of course, you know, Protestants would take issue with some of those claims. But in Celtic Christianity, we have this really interesting case of a more autonomous branch of the church. What's unique about it and why does that matter so much in our remembrance of St. Patrick and Celtic Christianity? I think what's unique about it is that from the very beginning, it realized that being a Christian was very serious business, deadly serious business, could cost you your life. Celtic Christians talk about martyrdom as a way of life. They had basic ideas about martyrdom. They had them color-coded, if you will, white martyrdom, green martyrdom, red martyrdom. But every Christian was called to be a witness for Christ, and they took that very seriously from the beginning, even though they knew that was going to be difficult, especially in, amongst the Celtic peoples in Ireland. To back that up, then they imposed a very rigorous discipline on their own souls.